that we, we spoke on, on love, that, that we should love people, what? Even if they're different than us. Even if they make you uncomfortable. Even if they're politically different than us. Even if their sin is, is, is appalling to us. Love your neighbor even if they're your enemy. Because why we reflected on this week. We brought this home. Why? Because Jesus loved us and sometimes we don't understand how great a separation there was between us and God and yet he came to us and loved us. So I gave a couple practical examples from that passage. One, we should love by greeting. You know, our love is shown by who we greet and, and, and who we host in our home. Sometimes we just like greeting people that we like. You know, even with uh, Triana, we're in the Chicago Bears thing, you know, this morning. I still love Triana, and I still greet her and bless her, and even invite her. I love you, Triana. Right? But we invite people into our house. We host people. We greet one. How we, how we greet one another, how we host one another, right, is a reflection of the love and the understanding of the love of Christ for us. We should be meeting each other's practical needs. Like when we when we love our love goes it goes and it costs us something. We should be able to to share with others if we know a need. The Bible teaches us that if our enemies are hungry, we should feed them. If they're thirsty, we should give them something to drink. We should be ones that are are meeting practical needs for those who are around us because we have been loved by Christ. And then thirdly, I said we should be people of prayer. Right? Christ said we should. Pray for our enemies, even those who persecute us. Pray that they be blessed. Pray for their salvation. Pray that they come to know Christ. Pray for open opportunities that you would be the one that shares the good news of Jesus. Pray for those that are our enemies. And not pray in such a way that you want God to save them and knock them out and wait. Get away from them. No, pray that they would be blessed. Right? Because we are a people who are called to be a blessing. Well, last week I, I, I uh, want to, uh, I didn't speak on, I didn't touch on this last verse. So let's pick up on the, this important aspect that has probably produced some anxiety in our lives, probably produced some strain. But Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This was... This is hard. If we just talk about the aspect of the previous verses, uh, talking about how we should love our enemies, how we should not retaliate, or, you know, and, and, and oftentimes we get messed up with this aspect of justice and wanting to be just, right? Just think somebody slaps me on the cheek, I should be able to slap them back. Like, like, like justice. Is in and God introduces this perfection that not only is just, but is also merciful. But even beyond that aspect of how we can reflect on this verse, comes to mind these moments of desires to be perfect. And there's a saying that we may be familiar with that says, the perfect is the enemy of the good. In modern, in modern culture, Right, it's, um, productivity experts have kind of used this and massaged this a little bit. And they said, the perfect is the enemy of the done. This is sometimes my difficulty. I want everything to be done perfectly. I want it to be done soundly. I want it to look nice. I want it to be nice. And then I end up just not doing anything. Or uber-focusing on one thing and neglecting others. All of us at times neglect to do what we can do for the fear of doing it perfectly. You know, I've 
mentioned it already because I'm already thinking about the message. <laughs> All right? Our term for this is perfectionism. Sometimes we, we, we had a fear of doing something perfectly, it will, it will paralyze us and we don't, won't do anything, or, or we will so focus on it that we will neglect everything else so that we can get this thing perfectly right. Let's examine what fuels our perfectionism. <laughs> I'm confessing this whole message. What fuels our perfectionism? Perfectionism is not the same as the pursuit of excellence, right? But we want to do something excellently, but the, to pursue excellence, right, is to do well with the resource that we're given. Right? I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an honorable um, thing for us to do, that, that we will do well with the things that we have. But, but perfectionism, it, 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 it goes beyond that. And, and sometimes the line between doing something excellent and doing something perfection, with perfection, um, it, it gets blurred, right? Because perfectionism is is pride and, and or fear it's based in compulsion it fuels our obsession obsessions and our and it fixates us on being perfect and often times causes us to neglect doing other good things being okay <coughs> so what fuels it man we're complex people there's so many different things that could say fuels it, but I but I found in, in myself right that oftentimes my desire to be uh, to to be perfect is my uh, my fear or, or my desire to be accepted or my fear of being rejected. You know, that's oftentimes what's going on on Sunday mornings. If I, I just confess, I'll be I'll be Pastor Andrew. I'll just be Andrew. My fear of the chairs being out of order on Sunday mornings <laughs> is mostly based on, if I'm super, super honest, <coughs> just be real, that somebody's going to come in on Sunday morning and they're not going to want to worship with us. <laughs> <laughs> You laugh, it's true. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Yeah. You can examine those areas in your life where you want to make sure everything is yeah. perfect. Because you want to make sure that you're accepted by those who are around you. Oh, I can't I can't let that person in my house because What are they going to think of me? What are, what are they going to... No, no, I can't. No, I can't. I can't bake cookies for our cook because I don't know, sometimes they turn out <laughs> maybe a little crispier than I really want them to. Mm -hmm. A pursuit of perfection <clears throat> often is rooted in a desire for acceptance or a fear of rejection. A general fear of what people will think of you, it cripples us from being able to experience all that God has for us. Sometimes it's by the reason why we're that way is maybe from a, a, a current or present authority that is that is strong and, and over us, and we, we we are so in fear of what they will think of us or what they will do, or or if I make a mistake that I have to do things right, or maybe it's from a past abusive situation that caused your emotions to be wrecked. So then you live under this constant pressure, I have to be perfect, I have to have everything in order, and if I can't get in order, then oftentimes I do nothing. Because sometimes it's a convenient excuse not to do something hard. I can't do, this. I can't do it perfectly, so I'm not even going to try. In other words, it's not really perfectionism, but an indulgence that we wear as an excuse. Perfectionism is common to man, it's a common sin, it's a common pressure, and God desires us to be free from its rule over us. There's good news this morning. 
even as I confess all these things and I make myself look like a bull, uh, there is good news this morning. God desires us to be free from this yes. slavery to perfectionism. Yes. But when I read these words this morning again, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Oh God, it creates in me a little bit of pressure. At first glance, it definitely looks like a demand for perfection. And this morning, I would encourage us that it is. And it isn't. It is a demand for perfection. Be perfect as your Father in Heaven is perfect. And like I've said over the last few messages, then, as I look at the life of Jesus and I look at His words, and every time they, I want to leave Sunday morning with this like, yes, it's amazing, you know, we just got encouraged by the Word of God, and sometimes it's just like, it cuts me to the core and, and reveals to me again how much I'm not like Jesus. I get to this passage, and I know that it's a demand for perfection. But I also know that it isn't. Because Jesus, he, he makes this statement right at the end of this impossible instruction list, right? Don't anger, don't lust, don't divorce, don't swear oath, don't retaliate. Love your enemies in a way that's radically different than the what I want to do. But before this verse is given, we must look at Matthew 5, verse 17. Because this is where the good news, the deliverance from this performance-oriented, perfectionist, encouraged culture that we live in. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 do not think, Jesus is speaking here, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come to abolish them, not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Why did I pray my prayer? Why I prayed my prayer? Because I, uh, I've already written these, so I already knew, right? Or maybe I was aware, right? Okay, I pray, what? Jesus, help me to have faith in your perfect work. It is a demand for us to be perfect, and it isn't. Jesus came to perfectly fulfill on your behalf, on my behalf, God's demand for perfection. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Hebrews 10, 14 says it this way, right? By a single offering, Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so when I have mornings like this morning where I realize that I'm still not like Jesus, man, my times of worship, wow, thank you, Jesus. God, you're so amazing. Thank you that you sent Jesus, and Jesus, you lived perfect for me, submitted fully to God on my behalf. And now I can put my faith in the perfect work that you've done for me. And it frees me. If I truly believe this, it frees me from the enslavement of perfection. What is key to our liberation from this perfectionism is that Jesus lived, died, and rose for us and has already purchased our perfection. It's already completed for us. God the Father is not unaware of how sin contaminates everything we do. But he sees us 
who have put our faith in Jesus as perfect. We are made perfect by joining in faith with Jesus. So we are now free to engage imperfectly in our sanctifying process. So Andrew, what do you mean? Uh, are you giving me a you know get out of jail free card? I can just you know go and do whatever I want to you know no that's not what I'm encouraging us this morning. But I'm encouraging us that God knows who we are. And if we have put our faith in Jesus, the, the, the scripture we, we have talked about um, been quite a few weeks ago now, right? That we, that we would put our, our mind on him, that uh, we would love God with all of our heart, soul, body, and strength, right? We have decided to, to go in his direction. We have put our faith in Jesus, not only for our salvation, for our righteousness, but as our Lord who directs our life. We are free to imperfectly, just as we are, pursue that life of Christ. Amen. God isn't only is not a taskmaster. He is both holy and righteous and full of grace and mercy. Amen. The Bible nowhere encourages us towards perfectionism, this fear of acceptance, this desire that my, my work would make me acceptable to God. How many times have we said that on Sunday morning? My prayer is that we would choose to believe this. It's not our works that allow us to stand in right standing with God. It's not how great we can be. It's not how good we can be. It's not how many laws we committed. Why? Because if that were true, remember, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they would have had a one-up. Jesus would have never had to say, uh, speak the Sermon on the Mount, if just by doing things perfectly, we earn some kind of position with the Father. We earn acceptance. No. It's not by what we do. It's not by the words. It's not how, how great we are. It's about how perfectly Jesus submitted himself, even to the point of death, to every single demand of the Father. Amen. And the good news is, he did this not only for you, but he did it for me. Perfection is now given to us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, In Christ we have become the righteousness of God. In Christ, in what he has done, uh, the perfect life that he lived, now we have become the righteousness of Christ. So not only did Jesus perfect us now, but he also protects us, or gives us perfection in the future. In Revelation 21, 3 through 4, you know who's going to be around the throne room of God? Not the ones who set everything up perfectly, but those who have chosen to put their faith in the perfected work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And Revelation 21, 3 Amen. through 4 says that there will be a great crowd surrounding the throne in heaven. Yes. Oh, it's a gift of God's grace, free from perfection, perfect by faith, not by works. If you aren't convinced of this this morning, <coughs> All we have to do is look through scriptures to find and see God's grace exposing imperfection in others' biblical characters' lives, right? Abraham, father of faith. I laugh at this all the time. Father of faith, you're going to have a children. And all of a sudden, he tries to make things perfect 
and get things in his own hands and, and do a perfect work, as if he's doing God a favor. And, he, he, and you may be familiar with this story, right, that he, he sleeps with Hagar and, and they produce a child, and really it doesn't, it doesn't cause God's plan to advance or his kingdom to advance. It actually causes great division. But he's known as the father of faith. Moses, right, the Christ-like prophet who delivers the people and, and gets them out of Egypt and does these amazing things and, and in the wilderness, all of a sudden producing, uh, sorry, in, in, the, in the wilderness, and there's food, and there's, there's water, and all of a sudden God gives them an instruction, and, and, and it should be just like it always has been, and then instead of speaking to the rock, he smacks the rock. Aaron, the high priest, example of Christ, builds a golden calf. David, the Christ-like king, right, who, who's a man after God's own heart, who, who loves God and sees the expansion of the kingdom. And a child out of wedlock and, 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 and conspires to murder a husband. <laughs> Peter. Tripping over his words all the time, thinking he has it right. This is how it should go. This is what it should do. Multiple times, hindrance the gospel going forward. You know, he's one of the ones that said, I'm not really sure if we should be going and, and, and ministering to the Gentiles and the, the whole opposition of who we should eat with and who we shouldn't eat with. This is Peter, the rock. Acts through the, through the epistles, you can read your, your New Testament and over and over again. It, it shows how the early believers in Christ try to live out their faith. It shows them warts and all. And it, there's not one example of a perfect life outside of Jesus himself. God knows our imperfections and fills the Bible with stories of how his grace and mercy covers us. God has something better for us than, us, than our pursuit of perfectionism. Remember that, that fear of being rejected or that desire to be accepted that motivates everything we do. Right? God has something better than that. Because that only serves to be a weight on us. I cannot enjoy Sunday morning services when I'm in this place where everything is not right. Or not how I think it should be. Not how I want it to be. Not how I've put a weight on what things should look like. Perfectionism is a great danger. And it orients, our, orient, orients us on ourselves. tricks us into thinking that I can produce my own salvation or my own righteousness. I can produce in this Christian walk, I can produce this acceptance from God by how good I am. to do. They said, oh, I'll, I'll do it all. 
I'll get it all. I get the check mark done. Look at me. I've got everything in order. Look at me. I, I'm more perfect than you. Look at me. I, I, I have accomplished much. Accept me, Father in heaven, because my life is better. Romans 14, 23, it's in the middle of this struggle of what we should be eating or what we shouldn't be eating and talking about uh, sacrifice. And it says this, Romans 14, 23, whatever does not produce faith is sin. Whatever does not produce faith, whatever does not come from faith is sin. Whatever ways that I try to make myself acceptable to God in my own power is sin. God calls us to a life of faith in the work that Christ has done for us. And as I see, as I look to Christ, then my life produces what is good and pleasing in the sight of God. But oftentimes I get the order wrong. And if I'm really honest, right, I get the order wrong. I want to produce what is right and good in my life apart from God so that I have a better standing with Him. So that I have a better standing with my neighbors. So that I have a better standing with my, my, my friends. So I have a better standing with my neighbors. God desires us to be free from pride and from fear. I'll speak that one for you again. God desires us to be free from pride and from fear. Jesus encourages us forward to follow him in love and faith. And he knows full well that we will be imperfect. Do you know that's what that's why Christ did what he did? That's right. Amen. That's right. He knew we were imperfect, and we, he knew that he needed he needed to come to rescue us, to save us from our imperfections. No matter how much we grow in faith, no matter how much we grow in love, no matter how much we grow in reflecting the goodness of God in our life, we will always be dependent on Christ's work for us. Right? It never. It, Paul encourages the church. Uh, he he says this right. Though you began in. Faith, do you think now it's your good works that was your saved? No. Not at all. Lord, help me to believe this truth. God is calling us to the wonderful, refreshing dependence on Jesus. That we would take our eyes off of self, off of what we can do, off of what we can accomplish, off of what others think of us, off of any other external pressure and fix our eyes on Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says this, look to Jesus. Why? Because he is the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, desiring that we would share and that we would be seated, and, sorry, and now he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is the author, he is the founder, he is the creator of our faith, and he's the perfecter of it. What is our opportunity? What is our, our job? What do we do now? We don't look to ourselves, we don't try to produce more, we don't try and strive in this fear and, and desire for acceptance. No, we look to Jesus. And as our eyes are on Him, then our lives are transformed by His goodness as we continue to put our faith in Him. Put it this way. I put it this way before. This is hilarious today. So stop pursuing perfectionism. And 
be free to pursue love and faith. Pursue trusting Him. Fully believing on the work that He's accomplished for me has already made me acceptable to the Father. Proverbs 3, 5, right? Trust in the Lord with all of who you are. Do you want to be free from perfectionism? Andrew, do you want to be free from this desire to be accepted? Do you want to be fear from the, uh, free from the fear of being rejected? Trust that Jesus' work is good enough. Yeah. I can't produce a greater work. You can't produce a greater work than what Jesus has already done. Put your faith in Him. In Jesus, you are free. You are free to follow Jesus Amen. imperfectly. You are free to fight the fight of faith with defects. Really, that's the only way that we can fight the faith in this age. We won't be perfect until we what? We see Jesus face to face. So until that moment, we're working out our salvation, not on how we can do or accomplish, but we work it out with faith in Jesus, looking to Him and allowing who He is to transform who we are. And our prayer is and our hope is that as we continually look at Him, we will become more and more like Him. Or the way that we say that church, right, is that we will submit more and more of our life to the Lordship of Jesus. That's our walk. God doesn't want us to focus on our performing perfectly. He wants us to focus on living our childlike faith, dependent on Jesus. Yeah. So we go back to this verse, Matthew 5, 48. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. It is a demand for perfection. And it isn't. It's a demand that we put our faith Completely in the one, Jesus, who has fulfilled perfectly all of the law, all of the demands of God. And now we live not by works, not by sight, but by faith Amen. in Jesus as our Lord. So first and foremost, our response this morning is to repent of our perfectionism. Repent for the ways that our fear of being rejected or our desire of being accepted has dictated how we live our lives. But also, our response this morning is to receive by faith the perfect work of Christ. We can't add anything more to what he's already done. And his instructions for us to be perfect is already with the knowledge that we're imperfect. That it exactly encapsulates our need for Jesus. He came not because we were good and he needed to add us to his number. He came because he knew we were imperfect and he knew without him coming and living perfectly, we would never have hope in the future. Let's pray this morning. sit here this morning grateful for your son Jesus and all of who he is 
we do adore you, Jesus. That you would come, born in a manger, humble to yourself, to live the life we could have lived. Thank you, Jesus, for fulfilling the demand of perfection each one of us in this room, for myself included. Father, now we also know we must repent. We must believe on this truth that Jesus has done the work for us. Forgive us. Forgive me for ways that I have tried to live life fear of rejection, God, with a desire for acceptance. We thank you that through Jesus we have acceptance from the one who matters most, our Father in heaven. In this moment, I pray you would cleanse us the end of our unrighteousness, close us with the righteousness and set us free, that we may live by faith in the Son of God, 